Thank you for once again visiting our website at firstbaptistwesterville.com. And uh, we are glad that you're here with us tonight for this uh, Good Friday service. As we will be later on in the message looking at what is good about Good Friday. And we're going to see from the scriptures uh, the passage talking about Jesus as he went to the cross at Calvary. And as he died on the cross for our sins. And as he was buried. And then when we come back together again on uh, Easter Sunday on the resurrection. We'll do as Paul Harvey says the rest of the story. And see concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And tonight we want to uh, begin by looking at a couple of verses in the book of Colossians chapter 1. Uh, as we continue to think about uh, the coronavirus and the response and uh, the updates that we see concerning the, uh, the hospital in New York City uh, run by Samaritan's Purse and uh, the work that they're doing in sharing Jesus Christ with each one that comes in there. I heard Franklin Graham, he was interviewed about the uh, field hospital in Central Park and uh, he said, uh, so many were saying that even those that were dying in the hospital across the way, the one dear lady that her husband had died and she said, I was so sorry that he died alone. And so Franklin Graham said they began the most severe, most uh, critical of the patients. Uh, even as they brought them into the tent, he said, even if they weren't recovering, he said, we were going to make sure that there was the chaplains, there were the nurses, the doctors around them, praying with them, and uh, even helping them, even those that would go ahead and, and would die, that they would be able to die with somebody being around them and the love and sharing Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul wrote, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, and a lot of versions would say, in, through his blood, and then the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Now, that glorious news. You know, even though it's difficult and it's a tough time, I know in our country it's a tough time around the world uh, dealing with the coronavirus. And it's kind of hard, especially as the weather has been nice, uh, of having to stay in or to, to stay uh, at home as much as you can. Uh, we're thankful that even as that is the case, it's going to be temporary. Uh, but uh, we're grateful for the doctors and the nurses uh, the hospital personnel, each one in the nursing homes, those are working, uh, working hard and are at the front lines of all this and also the medics, the uh, first responders. Uh, we want to be mindful though that there is great ministry going on. And I wanted to give you a quick update. Uh, I was watching church services uh, uh, from Prestonwood Baptist Church, uh, Dr. Jo uh, Jack Graham, and uh, Glenna is very familiar with that uh, church in that area. Uh, Dr. Jack Graham made mention that last weekend there were over one million views to both uh, the radio, well, not viewing of the radio, but uh, uh, listening to the uh, PowerPoint radio ministry his TV ministry, PowerPoint, and also to Prestonwood Baptist Church, their services that, that reached about a million people. And there were several hundreds that have indicated salvation, have responded. And there are other ministries that are uh, having many coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ at this time. So we rejoice, and just like that, those verses said, the fact that he rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And that's taking place. People are responding to the gospel message and are being saved. Even in this difficult time, the word continues. The gospel ministry is going forth and we praise God for that. And uh, I've asked one of our deacons, Dale Patterson, is going to come and he's going to lead us in prayer. 
and he's going to pray for our first responders and those with the coronavirus. And we do give thanks unto the Lord that souls are being saved even right now. beautiful day that you have given us to enjoy even though we are separated from those that we love yes. that we can share the joy of the day with them and the joy of knowing what has happened on this Friday we would ask that you would be with the first responders the nurses and the doctors as they look after the people who have caught this unthinkable disease, that you would be with them, guide them, and guard them, and that they may share your good news with those who need it, who ask for it, that they can be protected as they look after these people. We'd ask that you be with our leaders as they make decisions regarding this disease and that if we follow what we are being told that we may see an end to this and then it would be a time of rejoicing but as we look forward to this time of the year of Jesus going to the cross for us may we truly remember the need and the reason for this time of the year Again, we would ask that you'd be with those who care for us. For it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen. In your Bibles, if you'd please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at uh, verses 21 through the end of the chapter, verse 47, as we consider about what is good about Good Friday. You know, we hear that term, Good Friday. And what we're going to see in the scriptures, it looks like anything but good. But as we get to the end of this message, we're going to see the application and why it is Good Friday. And the very reason why Jesus, even though he suffered and died and was buried, but he's going to rise again victorious over the grave. First of all, we're going to see in verses 21 to 32 the crucifixion of Jesus. In verses 21 and 22, we see carry the cross. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated, place of a skull. One of the things that they would do was concerning the one that was condemned as the prisoner, would be required to carry the heavy cross beam of their cross to the execution site. Severely wounded and weakened by his scourging, Jesus was unable to continue. We remember as we looked at this before in the passage, that the scourging, there was no limitations upon the number of beatings upon our Lord and Savior. There wasn't the limitation of 39 stripes like is what the Apostle Paul talked about among the Jews. But as the Romans administered that, and as many died even in the midst of that uh, scourging that took place, or the flogging it could be called. So now as Jesus begins to carry the, the beam of the cross to head to Golgotha, and this is outside of Jerusalem. It's outside because just like the book of Hebrews said that he would suffer, he would die outside the gate, outside the gate of the city. And so he's carrying the cross, but under the weight of that, he's unable to continue. And, and the soldiers, they press Simon of Cyrene, northern Africa, and says, come and you carry his cross. 
They would have one Roman soldier ahead carrying what would be put on the cross that would say, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, the charge against him. And then they had to have the other Romans around him. And then here comes Simon. He's probably come for the Passover feast. He has his two sons with him. And later on, those are, sons are mentioned because in the book of Romans, you're going to see the name of uh, Rufus is mentioned by Paul. And it very well could have been the same man. These uh, young men, or these, his children, were probably known to the believers there in Rome. And so if that's the, the same ones, then it very well could be. So then we have the third hour, verses 23 to 26. They tried to give Jesus wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. So they offered Jesus the wine mixed with myrrh to help to try to deaden the pain as they were going to be putting the nails into the wrist area and to the feet of the Savior. And as they were, he has carried the cross, Simon has brought it to the point of Mount uh, of, of Calvary, of Golgotha, the place of a skull. And there, as Jesus said, no, he didn't take of the wine mixed with myrrh to dull the intense pain he was experiencing. And Dr. Tony Evans writes, he was determined not to lessen the suffering that he had voluntarily submitted to. And so at this point, as you see in the other Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus would be saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Even as they're nailing him to the cross, that's in the imperfect tense in the Greek, which means that Jesus repeated this probably numerous times, maybe with each time that as they're nailing him, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And he would say that probably over and over and over again at this point. And as they had the hole, and remember Jesus' back is open from that beating, and then that sudden thud as they drop the cross into the ground, the intense pain as Jesus goes, that, as they drop that cross. And then the Bible says, and divided up his garments among themselves. Those were the outer garments that Jesus had. And, and so the soldiers are dividing among themselves those outer garments. But then he has one that's called the keton that would have been the seamless garment against the skin, the one piece that they don't want to divide that so they cast lots and to see which one will take that. Probably made by his mother Mary. You know that's a fulfillment of scripture. Psalm 22, 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Fulfilling these different scriptures that we see in the Old Testament. And then it says, it was the third hour when they crucified him. This would have been nine o'clock in the morning. At nine o'clock in the morning, as they crucify him. Then we see the charge. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. But if you compare all four gospels, that shows that the full inscription read, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That was the formal charge against Jesus. You see, the chief priests and the elders, they wanted Jesus put to death because they said, this is blasphemy. He's claiming to be deity. The Son of Man, the title that's found in Daniel, Claiming to be the Messiah, the deity. He needs to be put to death, they said. Verses 27 and 28. They crucified two robbers with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. 
You know, these robbers may have been partners with Barabbas of the insurrection. We don't know. There's some thought, some Bible commentators say they believe they were connected or they at least knew Barabbas and might have been involved with him. But there were two that were guilty and they were on the right and one on the left of Jesus. In verse 28, and the scripture was fulfilled. Numerous times we've seen this around the, the very presentation of Jesus going to the cross. And even beforehand, the scripture to be fulfilled. The scripture in Isaiah 53 Reads as verse 28, he was numbered with transgressors. Jesus is in the middle. And there are those two. And, and 700 years before Christ was born, there's prophesied that Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors. It's amazing, isn't it? But God's word is true. Every word, every prophecy that was regarding the crucifixion of Jesus Christ would take place just like the Bible said it would. Notice in verses 29 to 32b, the ridicule. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, oh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, Save yourself and come down from the cross. Yeah, you're, you're on the cross now. You who said that you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Let's see you come down and do that now. The mockery. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. See the sarcasm? You who have saved others, save yourself. Come down and prove that you're the Messiah, the Christ. When we see it, we'll believe it. Into verse 32, those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. Point E, the repentance. Do you realize that one of those criminals, one of those criminals, at first, the Mark records for us, both of them, the Bible says, were also insulting him. But at some point, one of those criminals stopped insulting and repented and was believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, and verses 39 to 43, the Bible says one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, Remember me when you come in your kingdom. He said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. One of those criminals hanging on that cross changed his mind. He repented. He turned. He had a change of thinking about who Jesus is. He went from hurling the insults at him to believing that he is a king. Warren Wiersbe, in his Bible Exposition commentary, wrote, It is possible that their sarcastic, he saved others, may have encouraged the one thief to trust him. The thief may have reasoned, if he saved others, then he can save me. So God uses even the wrath of man 
to praise him. Psalm 76 and verse 10. You know, it's very possible that God, through the Holy Spirit, showing that criminal that this isn't just any man. He already said he's done nothing wrong. He's sinless. He's not guilty. We're here guilty. We're, we're getting what we deserve. But this man, could he be the Messiah? A king? And he asked him, would you remember me when you come in your kingdom? And truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Can you imagine as this criminal is hanging on the cross when he has repented and believed at some aspect at least that Jesus is the king and has a kingdom? And to hear those glorious words, this day. I ask you, what religious works could he do? He's hanging on a cross. He can't do anything on his own. He's crying out for the mercy of God. And he received it. He cried out and received assurance. Let's go to point two on your outline, death of Jesus. We've been talking about the crucifixion. But now as we start in verse 33, the death of Jesus is quite a wonder. And we're going to see several wonders. First of all, there's the wonder of darkness. In verse 33, when the sixth hour came, it's now noon. When noon came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. From noon to three o'clock, it's dark. The brightest part of the day. This is, friend, a supernatural darkness. There have been many that are trying to say eclipse or all these things. But what had to happen before there was Passover? You had to have the full moon. And this wasn't some eclipse. This was the work of God. We're reminded. I don't think it's by accident that you read in the book of Exodus. What was the plague before the death of the firstborn was announced? It was the plague of darkness that fell upon Egypt. Darkness. It was a darkness that they could even sense and feel the darkness. For three days, it was completely dark. You had that judgment before the death of the firstborn announced in Egypt in the book of Exodus. I believe that we see that in light of what Jesus is doing on the cross. This is God's judgment. This is supernatural and the darkness that came upon the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. The wonder of the darkness. In verse 34, you have the wonder of the question. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is an exact quotation from Psalm 22, 1. The Eloi, Eloi, the other in the Gospel of Matthew, it's Eli, Eli, because that was the Jewish, but this is Aramaic that Mark is repeating, is, is quoting. But it's meaning, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the wonder of the question. You know, really, there's the wonder of the silence. 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, you know, even in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, chapter 1 and verse 13, our Lord cannot look upon wickedness. And even though Jesus is the sinless Son of God, He's at the cross and He is bearing the sins of the world. Even at that point. The Father did have to look away. He could not look upon His own Son as He's bearing the sins of the world. My sins, your sins, he is bearing those sins at that very time. When we think about the wonder of the human heart, when some of the bystanders heard Jesus crying out, they began saying, Behold, he's calling for Elijah. They thought he's yelling out for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Verse 37, the wonder of his death. And Jesus uttered a loud cry. I believe the loud cry that is uttered here was the one word to tell us die that means it is finished or paid in full the sin debt was paid in full and then we have another one of the gospels that Jesus would say father into thy hands I commit my spirit And then the Bible says, he breathed his last. After Jesus uttered a loud cry, he breathed his last. His last. Look what happens in verse 38. Remember all the people that have come to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover? Remember all those that are, have come and are, they're preparing to slay the lambs? As Jesus, the Lamb of God, is dying on the cross, there they are with the lambs. But those, can you imagine the news as they come out of the temple? The veil of the temple has torn from top to bottom. Friend, man didn't tear the veil, God did. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 19 to 22, we're reminded. The Bible says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. As the book of Hebrews is saying that we have the access that we can come boldly to the throne. The reality is under the old system, under the law, you have the high priest one time a year on the day of atonement that can go in and offer sacrifice both for himself and his family before he can offer the sacrifice for the nation. But now the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom. Why? Because Jesus Christ has died for our sins and on the, by the basis of his completed work that we can approach the throne. His righteousness by the work of Christ, the wonder of the torn veil. All oh, the multitudes that have come and they said, the, the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. You know, man tried to repair that, but they couldn't. They could not. 
Because God is the one who made that way and opened up access for us to go before him. At a home, that's a great place for an amen because that's the reality that we have of being able to go before Almighty God on the basis of the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the torn veil. In verse 39, the wonder of the statement. When the centurion, this is the man in charge of the Roman soldiers, who was standing right in front of Jesus, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Truly, this man was the Son of God. That man had seen numerous people, had seen numerous die of crucifixion, being crucified on the cross. But he's like, something is different. This is totally different than anything I've ever seen. He died like no one I have ever seen on this cross. He had, we heard him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And in the response to the insults and all the hurling and, and all these things as he remained quiet for all this time, but then he would say, when he said, it is finished or paid in full. And when he said, Father, into their hands I commit my spirit. This wasn't like any man that I've ever seen be crucified. And that centurion saying, surely or truly, this man was the Son of God. I believe we're going to see that centurion in heaven. I believe he came to the point to say, this, this man, he wasn't just any man. He was almighty God. And he was sinless. But he was put to death. What words of mercy. The way he died. The wonder of the statement. Verses 40 and 41, the wonder of the faithful women. The Bible says there were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the less, and Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. They were faithful women. They were there and they were watching as Jesus died. Now Mary, the mother of Jesus, wasn't mentioned there, but she was in the Gospel of John. Mary was there. There were other Marys that were there. These women, as they watched Jesus, they watched as he died on that cross. Can you imagine, even as Simeon told Mary, when we looked at that in Luke chapter 2, around Christmas time, that all oh, your, your soul will even be pierced. There will be anguish. And that anguish that Mary, the mother of the Lord, had as she watched Jesus, as he was tortured and nailed there on that cross and died, Then we have the burial of Jesus. The Bible says, when evening had already come, because it was a preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council of the Sanhedrin, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Joseph's courage. He goes before Pilate and says, I would like the body of Jesus. And Pilate, the Bible says, was amazed or wondered, has he died that quickly? And you remember, as we saw in other Gospels, where 
They're going to break the legs because of the crucifixion of breaking the legs so they wouldn't be able to go up and down to get the breath because they could stay on the cross in the crucifixion for days as long as they could get up and down and get that breath. And so Pilate was amazed that Jesus was dead. And so in verse 44, Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. It was courageous of Joseph. And we see that Nicodemus was also going to help. And they were going to prepare the body. It said a hundred pounds of weight as they would bind Jesus. And, and then he's going to be going to Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Verse 46, Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. What we see from the book of, of, from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 27, verses 59 and 60. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the, in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Then also in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And beginning with verse 38, the Bible says, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe and about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Even where Jesus was buried is fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. We must see in Isaiah 53 and verse 9 what was prophesied about the Lord. The Bible says, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He was with a rich man. Joseph of Arimathea's tomb was where Jesus was buried. There are some that would say, well, the women went to the wrong tomb. No. Notice verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on. They were observing to see where he was laid. They saw exactly where that tomb was. They didn't go to the wrong tomb. They observed the place of burial. Jesus is buried. We've seen the crucifixion of Jesus. We've seen the death of Jesus. We've seen his burial. We go back to that question. What is good about Good Friday? We've read about the agony that Jesus is experiencing physically and spiritually on the cross. And we look at this and say, this is a tough scripture. It's tough to read. It's tough to fathom the anguish of our Lord. What makes this good? 
He came to do the will of the Father. And as one of the cries of the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. It is finished. He finished the work that he came to do. He finished the work. Everything, just like Isaiah 53 said, Jesus did. Just like Psalm 22 said, Jesus did. Just like Isaiah 50 and all the physical torture and the spitting and the beating, all that he endured, it all took place. He endured it. He finished the work. Here's why it's good. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was prophesied, Isaiah 53. Going all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Remember Adam and Eve have sinned against the Lord. They hide themselves from the presence of the Lord. Sin separates. They're separated from God. But God says in Genesis 3.15 to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. Her seed is talking about Jesus, the very, the very reality of the virgin birth of Christ. It had to be the virgin birth in order to be the Savior, to be able to be the substitutionary atonement on the death of Christ at the cross for us. That Jesus would be born of a virgin. He would be sinless in his life. He was sinless in his death. He is sinless. But Jesus would say, or as we see in Genesis 3.15, that Jesus would give a death blow to Satan. And you will bruise his heel. He will cause, be caused to suffer. And that was fulfilled with Jesus dying on the cross. Isaiah 53, 6 was fulfilled with Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. How do we know that's fulfilled? One last passage I would like you to go with me to. I believe with all my heart it's one of the most important passages you're going to see in all of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And to give the final response of why could this Good Friday be called good. In verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible says, He, reference to God the Father, made Him, Jesus, God the Son, who knew no sin. Jesus never had any sin. To be sin on our behalf. Friend, where were, where were our sins placed? Upon Jesus Christ. Say, wait a second. I, I'm born so much later than when Jesus died on the cross. Friend, Jesus' death on the cross is effective for every single one going from Adam to the very last one. Our sins were placed upon Jesus Christ. He who made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He laid our iniquity, all of it, upon his son Jesus Christ. But those who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So here is the other aspect. When we would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, that He died there in my place, 
He took my penalty. He paid my sin debt. What I couldn't pay. When I understand that, then the Father gives me the righteousness of Christ to my account. He, the term is he imputes that. He, he puts to my account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when I go to the Father in prayer, He doesn't see Brian Grove. He doesn't see my righteousness. My righteousness is like filthy rags, Isaiah says. He sees the righteousness of His own Son, Jesus Christ, applied to my account. Friend, that's why Good Friday is good. The agony of the cross that Jesus endured for us, he did it in obedience to the will of the Father. When he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was bearing the sins of the world. And the righteous, just Father could not look upon his son at that very hour. But when he said, it is finished, he was able to say, Father, into thy hands, commit my spirit. Jesus said in John 10, he's the good shepherd. And the good shepherd loves the sheep and gives his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus did. He died for you. He died for me. Maybe as you've watched this message, you come to that reality that you've heard a lot about Good Friday before. But maybe you've never come to that point. Where you said, I recognize I've sinned against God. And Jesus was on the cross, dying there for me. I talked before about the tugging in your heart. That's the Holy Spirit showing you that you need to say yes to Jesus Christ. Friend, I can't force you. No one could make you. But you can choose. God has given us, he has made us with an intellect, with emotions, and a will. Will you choose to say yes to Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Maybe it's a day on this Good Friday. You said it makes sense. The Lord has shown me that it makes sense that my sins were placed upon Jesus and he died there for me. He took my penalty. He took what I deserved. He took my place. I believe that he loves me. And he died for me. And I want to call out to him. You can pray something like this. Dear Jesus. Right now I see. That you took all my sins. Upon yourself. And you died on that cross for me. You were buried and you rose again just like you said you would. Right now I believe that you died on that cross for me and I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. 
Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. And maybe you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But you know you've been reminded from the word how much he loves you. Maybe you have, as the Bible says, in Psalm 66, verse 18, if you regard iniquity in your heart, he will not hear. And you say, you know, I want to respond to the Lord. And I want to be back in right fellowship with him. In the book of 1 John 1, 9, it says that if we would confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. And says, you know, I don't want to have anything between me and the Savior. I want to be in right fellowship with him. Right where you are, you can confess your sins unto him. And he has promised it's the same precious blood that was shed at the cross at Calvary that cleanses your sin as a child of God in the family. And that you receive that forgiveness in the family and right fellowship with him. I encourage you, don't put that off if he is speaking to you right now. Wherever you are watching this, can you make it a place of an altar where you with just a place to talk to the Lord and call out to Him? We're going to conclude in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do have your word. Thank you for the fulfilled prophecies. Thank you that indeed it can be called Good Friday because of the completed work that you did for us, Lord, at the cross. Even so much of being buried in the tomb of a wealthy man, even that fulfilled a passage of Isaiah 53. Lord, as we read these Old Testament passages, we're in awe. Even when you were on the cross and Jesus, you said, I thirst or I'm thirsty. And, and you said to fulfill the scripture. Lord, we thank you for who you are. And you are so great and we love you. Speak to hearts we ask now. And may we be obedient to you. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.